Hello, welcome to the Math Together Show where thoughtful math educators gather and learn together. I am Molly Voki. I'm Sue Looney. And I'm Heidi Subnani. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We're really happy to have you. Yes. We have another amazing guest here today who is going to talk to us about this question. What is mathematics really? What counts and who decides? So we were talking before the show and we were starting to get really excited about this topic and we are excited to talk to Marion Dingle about this. So um, if you are listening, please feel free to say hello in the chat. Um, hit like and um, chime in at any time. Great. And just while we're here, we want to uh, let you know that we are available to um, provide professional development. And we're currently actually looking for districts that want to partner with us. So you can go to that website that um, Molly, if you want to advance yep. the banner. Sorry. There you go. Sorry. So if you can go, if you're interested, um, we're, we're seeing a light at the end of the tunnel. The fact that I can even mention that we're looking in the next year is amazing, but we're looking for partners that wanna transform math education. And so if that sounds like you, please reach out and, and let us know. And if you're an individual teacher um, who is looking for some conversation and some assistance in your math learning for your classroom, and you are not on our mailing list, you can get on that really easily by texting Looney to 22828. Um, there's a newsletter that goes out um, about once a month. And then we have free resources that are available to you as well um, that we would love to share with you and get your feedback on and see how they can help you in your classroom. Yes, yes, yes. And Heidi gets to introduce Marion yes, to us. I do. One moment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Transform <laughs> with the readers. Okay. Well, we're really excited to have Marion Dingle with us um, this evening. She is a veteran classroom teacher of 21 years, and she's always passionate about mathematics. Her early career um, involved advocating for marginalized students and their families. More recently, she has moved towards public advocacy, activism, and scholarship, fascinated by the intersection of mathematics and social justice. She has been a member of the building leadership teams and led grade level teams, served on district mathematics and states committees, and has been selected to the principal's advisory committee. And she also mentors new educators. As a Heinemann Fellow, she is currently researching the ways in which positive cultural identity affects student confidence, efficacy, and academic performance. She speaks nationally about culturally responsive teaching and pushes conversation through her blog and on Twitter and in person. She's written for NCTM Publications, Mathematics Teacher, the Global Math Department, and Ed Week, and has been featured on podcasts such as Teaching Hard History and Pushing the Edge. She is a member of the NCTM Annual Meeting Program Committee in Atlanta, which we hope to see you there, everyone. <laughs> and then the NCTM Classroom Resources Committee. She's the director and editor for the NCTM Journal, um, MTLT, and it is a member of Teaching Tolerance Advisory Board. So we are so thankful that she is here to spend some time with us this evening. Um, let's welcome Marion. Hi, Marion, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me tonight. Oh, well, it's great to see you. We are so excited about this. Last year in March, we were looking forward to seeing you in person in Worcester, and that did not happen with everything in the world. So we are so thankful that you were willing to come on and talk with us tonight. Yes, yes. yes. I remember that day. I yes. was in an airport and I got a call. And I was explaining that I wasn't sure if I'd be able to make it. And I said, you know what? Never mind. <laughs> it's, it's okay. It's a done deal. Yeah. Life just yeah. changed, didn't it? It changed it really did. quickly. We were, we were looking forward to it. And, and a lot of things just shut down at that time. And some things have continued. And, and who would have thought at that time that we'd still be in a, in a phase of shutdown now? Yeah, it's right. almost March when you think right. about it, right? It's almost yeah. February. Yep. Yeah, yeah, wow. right. Yeah, almost right. a year. Yeah. So 
Well, let's start with our first question. And this is always the question that we ask all of our guests because it helps our listeners get to know you if they don't already. And it always is a treat for us because it's always a good story. So what is your why? Why education? How did you get to the place where you are right now? Okay. Um, that That's a great question. I love that you start with that question. So I am the daughter of an educator. My mother was an educator. She's no longer living. Um, and I was raised by two parents who absolutely told me that going to college and getting a degree was an expectation. There was no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And in the same sentence, my mother would always tell me, but if you major in education, I'm not paying for it. So I never, ever considered education. It just never crossed my mind. I kid you not. I grew up wondering, you know, what I was going to do. I liked math. I had no idea what I wanted to do with math. I started off majoring in math, ended up getting a degree in econ, um, thought I wanted to be a professor, um, started the road, started, finished a year of a uh, doctoral program in econ. And that was the first year that I had my first daughter. And for those of us that are parents, you know, everything changes. I was completely fascinated by her and how she learned. And all I wanted to do was figure that out. She was just such an interesting puzzle. Um, so long story short, I became an educator and I think my why, why I do this, why I continue to do this is, you know, growing up in my community, I had a very strong support system. I'm an only child, but I was surrounded by my mother's friends who were all educators and they became my family. Like, you know, education was, was my norm. And as I started teaching, um, you know, I went to a progressive program through Emory and we were bred to be change agents. And I just wanted to set the world on fire. Um, and no matter where I went, um, I've been in different schools, different settings, different states, public, private, no matter where I've gone, students who look like me are always at the bottom. And it's just unsettling to me. So I think my why is doing my part in changing that whole dynamic. I mean, my children have survived K-12 ed, and I hate to say it that way, but they did. They survived. They're great kids. They're adults now. They're doing well. Um, but I don't really want my future grandchildren to go through what my kids went through, what I went through, what my husband went through. Um, education for, you know, black mm -hmm. people is, is different. It can be, it can be pretty damaging. So just trying to change that. You know, oh, that's I, that's all. <laughs> I, um, I, I feel like, you know, you raise such a critical uh, problem that, that, it, it persists. And I wonder, do we have hope in this moment that as, as a nation specifically in the U S we've, we've come up against such hurdles this year that, that this is the time we finally get it and we make those changes. I just, I just, I dare to, I dare to have some hope. Um, but it's hard sometimes to have that hope. So I'm just curious where we're all at with that. I, we, is this our moment? Is this is this the moment when educators understand the power to do harm or the power to do good? And, and in specific, when we talk about the education of black and brown children and other, you know, underrepresented populations, do we do we get it now? Because we're all in such a tough state. I just I dare I, to believe I, we do. Yeah. I oscillate between between that being the case and then. Um, and then us being kind of like at rock bottom, there's only one place to go and it's up, but I oscillate because I'm wondering if it's just my white perspective that wants to see it that way, because I, 
I can't actually see it as a black or brown person. And so I wonder if my optimism is just sheerly out of the want for things to be different. Um, and knowing that we've been going, we as a country have been going through this for so many decades and decades and decades that change is slow. I don't know. Yeah, I I tend to be the less optimistic of, yes, you of do. the three of them. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I like, so in my personal family situation, my dad is from India, my mom is Caucasian. And so there was a definite um, delineation in my own family growing up, depending on the color, like the color variation of my siblings and I, as to how we were treated. And, um, and I think that the last four years have brought out an underbelly in our country that has always been there, but that was hidden or maybe not as acceptable for a shorter period of time. And when we look at, I didn't have an educator um, of color until I was in the seventh grade, I think. So everyone, and so I, like, I think about that for like the students that I work with. Do you have anyone who, who looks like you um, in, in, the, in a space and, and in that role? And then where do we, when we see just the things that happened this summer versus what's happened in this last couple of weeks and that there were some educators in who were storming the Capitol. And it's been like, I tend to feel less optimistic, but then I meet wonderful teachers doing amazing work and willing to have really hard conversations. There's the hope there. And there's right? the hope, but systemically I, I am concerned still. Yeah, it's the pockets. Um, I think for me, I mean, of course, in order to keep moving, mm -hmm. keep one foot in front of the other, you have to have hope. Okay. We, you know, we all know that. Um, and I tend to tweet out my feelings. It's, it's how I process. Um, I was in my feelings earlier and I, I tweeted and now I feel better because now I understand that there are others that are feeling the same way. <sighs> yes, I think that there is room for you know, all of us to make change individually. I think that's part of it, but I'd also agree with Heidi that it's got to be systemic change too. Um, we as classroom teachers right now are going through something that I believe is unique to other people. Um, we don't feel appreciated. We feel gaslighted. We feel a certain way. Um, and we also feel powerless in this moment. So, you know, the individual can do, you know, something on, on some level, but it's got to be systemic because there's tons of people that just don't have the power to change. They have to depend on other people. And that's where, you know, whatever privilege you have, you know, it's on you to spend that privilege for good. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I think the, you know, the variation of, as far as educators, I'm not sure how many of us we're very surprised. We had a lot of, if we look back a year ago, right? So in March and April, oh, you know, teachers should be making a million dollars and <laughs> and to where we are now, where you should just be back in school. Yeah. And so that, um, that feeling and whiplash for, for all of us, I think is, is really challenging when it's, it's about health and safety of, of teachers and how we provide that support for them. It's about health and safety of all of us. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's, yep. that's where it's getting lost. I think a lot mm -hmm. of us are. No, very good point. Being, you know, being selfish and mm -hmm. being up for ourselves and not caring about the kids. And I think that couldn't be further from the truth. It's because we care about everyone that we want everyone to be safe. Mm -hmm. And for the first time, we are actually including ourselves in wanting to actually survive and be healthy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, anyway, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. we got to get to tonight. So. Yeah. I know. 
Well, Pamela chiming in and she says um, that that feeling of powerlessness is so difficult. Thanks for bringing up the, the system needing to change. So um, we're, we're all on the same page for that. Um, well, let's get to the nitty gritty. Well, so, so I think it, in the context of mathematics, it, it's such a powerful conversation. You know, how do we, how are we change agents? And um, there's just a lot of layers. So this, this seemingly, I, we, we've had a lot of debate and thinking about your question in advance of tonight. And so let's get to this. So what is mathematics really? What counts and who decides? So where do we begin with this, Marion? Where do we roll up? Uh, I'll get my sleeves rolled up. <laughs> I can talk about this all night. You know, my friends and I, yeah. we talk about this all the time. Um, I, I found the quote that I, I was searching for earlier. I think- Oh, good. Einstein, I'm not sure, um, but this is how it goes. Not everything that counts can be counted and not everything that be, that can be counted counts. Mm -hmm. I've been thinking about that quote since I was a child. Um, hmm. When I say that, you know, I was raised in this educator community, when I think about my childhood and I think about um, the things that I've learned and the mathematics I've learned, I don't only think about schooling. I think about my parents. I think about my dad at the kitchen table showing me secrets of math. I think about my mom, teacher mom, who would dump out the change in her purse and dare me to count it. Uh, I think about my godmother who would have entire weekends, just the two of us, and we would play games, board games, card games, all kinds of things that were reinforcing of strategy and how I always thought of that as math. Um, so when I think about, you know, what is math really? I kind of lucked up on elementary teaching, I think, because I don't know, because I, when I entered teaching, I was already, already a mother and I was, you know, fascinated with my child. So, but I, I think I could have, been an educator at any level, really. But in elementary, you know, you're supposed to be a generalist. You teach a little bit about every subject. Because I loved math, though, I could find the math in just about every, anywhere, because that's how I was raised, really, um, to look for that math, to find it, to find the patterns. Um, so when we talk about what counts as math, I think about, you know, those memories. I think about um, baking cookies. I think about double dutch. I think about music and time signatures and um, the beats, which beats do you clap on? Are they odd or even? Um, all of these things that can be attributed to how I grew up, this, the different um, experiences that I had that were very separate than schooling. We are close to February. Um, I tell my students that, you know, they know that February is Black History Month. I also tell them that when I was their age, there was Black History Week, not month. And that that was really hard fought for to get the week. But we never talked about Black history in school that was always something that was done in church. And it was prepared for for a month. I mean, you had your Sunday school teacher. She um, had the list of all the different people. She assigned who was gonna do what. Um, we had a lot, a lot of times there were people we'd never heard of. I remember that's how I realized who Ralph Bunch was because I was assigned a paper in Sunday school that I had to oh. present on a certain day in Bla and on Black History Week Sunday. Um, so, so those type of things. Um, and, you know, again, because that's the way I was trained to think, I think mathematically, I think, okay, at first it was a week. Now it's 28 days. You know, what kind of percentage change is that? Like how much mm -hmm. more should we be thinking about this? How can I extract that information that people cram into those 28 days and extend that throughout the year? So this is, you know, kind of where all those questions kind of overlap because it's not just what is the math and what counts as math, but 
you know, it, for me, who decided what math was, you know, depended on which context I was in. You know, if I was in school, it was, you know, school math, textbook, algorithm. If it was my dad, it was patterns. If it was my godmother, it was um, strategy, um, um, different moves, literally counting cards, um, uh, playing with dice and memorizing different moves, you know, like on a backgammon board. If you get a six, two, you know, where, where you move your, your pieces. Um, so yeah. And, and, and then you put all that on top of, you know, all the subjects that I teach, you know, I can think about that with social studies. I can think about that with literacy and science. So that's, that's kind of where I am. I don't have a ton of answers, but I love to ask questions and think about things and, and talk with people. You shared a lot of your personal experiences that you brought from home to this mathematical lens that you have, right? So there's the way that you were raised, the things that were important to you, what was conveyed by the adults around you. And it makes me think about student voice. So it would be so lovely to leave room to hear from all students like, well, well, what was math? What's mathematics for you? Like the rich cultural backgrounds that students come from that's ripe with mathematics that they might bring to the table, but we didn't label it math. So it makes me think about we need to um, open it up and not have these gatekeeper moments of saying, here's what mathematics is. And you either do or don't fit the mold. But instead, we could say, who are you? And, and what mathematics interests you. And so I definitely exactly. for those opportunities. But it's interesting the way that she was describing, Marion, um, that, you know, school mathematics looked a specific way. And I think kids today still say that, even if we've, you know, come far in since we were, were kids in the classroom. Um, you know, this is what school mathematics is the book, right? And then outside of school, the way you were describing it was way more fun, right? It was all about challenge. It was about um, games. It was about interesting things. And, and I think that, you know, there's still a lot of kids out there who see mathematics in all mathematics only in the way that you observed school mathematics to be in. And that to me is, is where we need to start making some change. And, and that brings the humanization that you experienced in your personal life for mathematics back into the classroom, I think. Yeah, mm. exactly. I think that's what we talk about when we say that we need to start with relationship with a child, mm -hmm. um, because it's not really about me imposing what math looked like in my childhood on my kids. It's about knowing them well enough to help them identify what they're experiencing in their lives as math. Right. Um, to, to enable them to see math in everything the way I tend to see math in everything. Right. But, you know, their vision is going to be different than mine because mm -hmm. their context is different. Right. Well, and have that ability to see that math as just as important as school math. You know, I think... Um, it's a hard sell. <laughs> it is. It's a really hard sell. It's a hard sell. It's a hard sell for some educators, <laughs> you know, like depending on what grade level I'm working with on a given day, it's a really hard sell. Um, and I think the more specialized we become the, in the mathematics journey upwards through the grades, the more of those gatekeeping moments happen. And so like my ability to think or, um, to do game-based learning and be strategic outside of, of school, might that might be the kind of mathematics that I engage in. But what what is how do I bring that to the classroom? And is it we have to make room for that as teachers, and then we have to go looking for that, right? And how and how is that? How does that work within the context of what what is happening here? Because I think that that's that that piece of what counts and who counts, who counts as a mathematician and 
when we mentioned this at the beginning, just that idea of does a does a plumber count as a mathematician? I would say yes, because they <laughs> have a couple of plumber mm-hmm. friends who do more math on a on a everyday basis as far as like real life it has real life consequences to what happens in your house <laughs> if you make a mistake versus um you know, some a theoretical mathematician necessarily, you know, like that that is gonna be different. And how do do we value that mathematics in the same way? Ooh, that's a deep question. And I would say probably we don't. Um no. but why like why? Why why are we not seeing the value and the flexibility that it takes in those moments to problem solve. Well, because you don't, if you're not the plumber or you're not the carpenter, you're not actually doing the math and you're not watching that person. You're just paying them. So you don't, you don't see what they're doing. You pay them to do something. So you don't have to do it. And honestly, I I remember my brother-in-law, he struggled in math. I actually remember tutoring him as an adult to get through one one class that he needed to take. And then he would come over and he built a shed for us. And I watched him take a piece of wood and do some fraction stuff on it. But he was really not doing the math on there. He was just keeping the notes so that he knew what the answer was. But he was doing all that fraction math in his head. And as you know, most people don't do fractions in their head voluntarily. And so, you know, he was, he was a mathematician. He would have never called himself one, but as you make me think of it now, he totally was. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. May I ask a question? Sure. Of course. Okay. So this is what this makes me think of. I think about this a lot as a classroom teacher. Okay. Um, Who gets to be called a mathematician? Mm -hmm. Is a mathematician someone that has... A doctorate, someone in the academy, is a math teacher a mathematician? Is an elementary math teacher a mathematician? Is a plumber who does math a mathematician? Is a child who's learning math a mathematician? Like, who do we call mathematician? Like, what does mathematician even mean to us? I don't know how to answer that question, but I'll tell you this, and it relates back to what Heidi was saying before. When I go into classrooms of elementary school, I often hear teachers calling their kids mathematicians. Mm -hmm. And as you get up in the grades, even in a single elementary school, you might hear them saying that in first grade and second grade, but you probably don't hear them saying that as you get into the fourth grade and the fifth grade. And I never hear middle school teachers calling their students mathematicians. So it's- interesting. It, I, I feel like, you know, elementary school teachers are all about ingratiating the child to, to believe in who they are. And then as we get up into the upper grades, the subject matter becomes more of the focus. And I think, Sue, you were saying something like that earlier. And even in grad school, like, no. like Heidi, as a grad student, do your professors call you mathematician? Or do they refer you to as to you as an aspiring mathematician? Mm-hmm. <gasps> right. You know, I I think, and Molly, you saying this as well. So I had an experience a couple of years ago in a, I think it was a fourth grade classroom. It may have been third, and so I've been working myself to not call students "Hey guys" or "Hey girl." You're like, and so I was like, okay, what else can I like? I need to train my brain to to say something else. So I've been using mathematician, like, because when I go in as, you know, a consultant, or I'm working with a teacher on something, I'm co-teaching with them. I don't know all the kids' names yet. I don't know. So I I need something that I can call. And so I was doing a number talk with students and I say, okay, mathematicians, what do we think? And there was a little boy, like out of the corner of my eye. And he looked at me like very affronted. He's like, who are you calling a mathematician? (laughs) Okay. And I was like, Where all of us. He's like, are you a mathematician? And I said, well, yeah, I'm here and I'm doing math and we're looking for patterns. And so that's, that's what being a mathematician is. We're all, we're working on math. We're sharing our ideas and we're, we're problem solving. And so that's what mathematicians do. And he's like, no, 
<laughs> sorry, you are wrong. He's like, no, no, mm -hmm. I don't think so. He's like, this is math class. He's like, this is not, he's like, you might be a mathematician. He's like, but I am not a mathematician. Okay. And, and I was like, okay, I need to respect that. But oh, like, how, how much do I push back on, you know, on that? And I think for me personally, sometimes I get stuck in like a mathematician is someone who finds joy in mathematics. Oh. Okay. So like I've, I've thought of it that way. Mm -hmm. But as, as the girls know, like I have a background in English. That's what my master's is. And I, that's where I started. I, I had math anxiety for years. Like, so I did not find joy and I still struggle sometimes to find joy in mathematics. Like they'll talk and like, Oh, Sunil's on here. I just saw him pop up. Like he, he's like one of those like joy in math, like just so fun to do. And I don't always find joy in it. I see, I can see the beauty in it. I can see, um, you know, like the art connections, I can see a company, but I don't always, my, I still struggle myself to consider myself a mathematician. I love learning how kids learn math. I love seeing them think about it, but I struggle still to consider myself because I don't always find joy in it. And I wonder, I wonder how much that plays into it. But this this is going full circle. And so because because I know you so well, I know that obviously we're all mathematicians. Right. But you're an it's like you're an amazing Heidi is an amazing baker. And she oh. makes these works of art that I don't get to eat them because I have I'm I'm gluten free, so she wouldn't even bother cooking for me the her baking. <laughs> But they're they're gorgeous, and I'm picturing this. There's like this swirl, right? So yeah. I'm thinking about like the Fibonacci sequence, and yeah. like you are you're you're um, through baking. There's a tremendous amount of math mathematics happening mm -hmm. for your cake to come out like that, right? Because if you weren't being precise, if you weren't measuring, and and measuring is the oldest thing we have. Mm -hmm. We have a bone from twenty thousand a 20,000 year old bone from Africa that was used to measure. So you're measuring, you know? So, so I, I think we go full circle, like, well, what is math? But to your student who was like, oh, you know, <laughs> um, I might say to someone, um, are you a reader? Yeah. And then he would probably say yes. And I'd say, well, why are you a reader? And what, what might he say? Well, because I, I read. read. Okay. But do you math, right? Like we have a problem here because yeah. I, I'm a mathematician because I math. Well, what, so now we've gone back to what is, mm. what is mathematics, right? So Which is there's, exactly there's some, where we started, right? Yeah. Oh, I've had plenty of students who claim they were not readers. Plenty, yeah. trust me. Um, yeah. yeah, and it was my challenge at the end of the year to say, I'm going to make you say it. You're going to say it. You're going to, you're a reader. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So how about like, like um, hmm. a scientist mm -hmm. uh, or a mm -hmm. pianist, mm -hmm. a musician? Like what, what is the criterion? Is it joy? Is it um, competence? Like, like what is it? Is there something special about the label we put on one who does math, that mathematician label? that's different than pianist or guitarist mm -hmm. or orator. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that this comes down to the, these artificial expectations that we put on ourselves. So to be a pianist, um, it, or okay, I'll take my daughter. She's decided to teach herself guitar in the pandemic and she feels the need to keep qualifying it. I'm not very good. And I was like, why? You're playing guitar. You're learning guitar. You're now a guitarist because you pick up a guitar and you strum on that thing. So there isn't a requirement to be good, you know, at or, and there isn't necessarily a requirement around whatever, how we define these things. But if we engage in mathematics, which we do if we're human, because it's part of the human experience, we can't be human without engaging in mathematics, then, mm -hmm. then we're mathing and we're, and we're mathematicians, you know? That's so interesting though, right? It, because 
that's such a good example. That's so relatable because I, I wouldn't call myself a gymnast. Well, right now, because I, I don't do gymnastics right now, but at one point in my life, I did gymnastics and whether or not I was good didn't matter to me at that right. time. I mean, it did matter, but I, not in terms of calling myself a gymnast. I would have still called myself a gymnast. I would have still called yeah. myself a runner. Right. Um, and whether or not I was winning the race at that point to call myself that did not matter. So that's so interesting. I think as we get yeah. older, we're much more self-critical. Oh, definitely. And, well, I think, and yeah. being good is attached to the idea of being that thing. Yes. Right. 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 Our identity. We, we can't have that identity unless we're good at it. What's that? That's ridiculous. That's yeah, why that's those first graders are happy to be mathematicians because they don't, no one has yet told them that they aren't maybe. Yeah. You know, Yikes. so true. So what, what do we do? Why is it that we, we lose that? I mean, we're not the ones getting older. The students are older. Why, why do we think that that's important at a younger age? where it's not maybe so important as the kids get older or become adults? What is it that we're, these are things I think about all the time. What is it that we are doing? What is it that we are putting on our kids that we actually believe ourselves? I need another show for that in like one year. I might be able to think, <laughs> I need a year to think about that. <laughs> but I, I, I do, I think, that, that's so deep and so at the core of being a human that I don't know the answer to that. I think it requires be, being extremely vulnerable. And I think this is why our artists have really shined this year getting through the pandemic. You have to be vulnerable and raw and willing to be like, I, I am going to sing. Or I'm gonna mm -hmm. I'm gonna run or I'm gonna I'm gonna put it all on the table and I think we we just get knocked down as kids get older and I think it's about um, protecting protecting each other in those moments of vulnerability where we're willing to say I am me uniquely authentically in this moment right now I might not be good at it but I'm doing this. And I think as teachers, we need to see the authenticity and, and hold it up. I'm sorry, I just kind of preached a bit. I got a little emotional with myself okay. there, but that's I where that. I think, that's what I think it is. I think it's a really, truly allowing children the safety of being vulnerable. And, but and we, but and as we they grow up, as they grow up, continually offering that, because I think, it happens at the younger age where like, oh, you're so cute. Be who you are. And then they're like, oh, you're not as cute. So stop being like that. You know what I mean? I mean. Sad but true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so well, you I reminded me um, when you when you had your, your sermon a minute ago, <laughs> I had a reaction. I was thinking of Black Panther. Yes. You know, in the movie, there's this repetition of identity, like, you know, tell me who you are, show them who you are. Mm -hmm. I am, who are you, right? Um, and I think that, I, I, I try to, I don't always, I'm not always cognizant of it, but I'm really trying to make a conscious effort to um, draw kids' attention to their identity and how they are identifying in a moment you know, in mathematics, we want them to experience um, this risk-taking behavior and to feel comfortable um, in productive struggle. But how do you do that when you're not really comfortable in who you are? And, and we're guilty of that too, you know, as adults, of course, um, not wanting to make a mistake in front of our peers. I mean, we're very guilty of that. Mm -hmm. um, being like, I, I have always wanted to roller skate. I know how to not fall, but I don't know how to skate. Like I want to know how to skate. Mm -hmm. And I've tried a couple of times and, you know, I got a little embarrassed and, you know, I just, you know, do the little thing, you know, stand on the side and look cute. And then <laughs> I'd give up. And there've been so many times um, 
I'm really into these like Instagram reels and they have a lot of um, roller coaster mm-hmm. um, segments. But so many times I've told myself, I need to just go buy a pair and just 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 start practicing. And there's such a thing as virtual lessons. I need to to start doing this thing, but I don't. Come on, and I'm the one in front of kids that are you know that and I'm trying to you know mm-hmm. get them to do something that they've never done, and I'm reluctant too. Yeah, and I wonder sometimes if we we put barriers around academics systemically. We put barriers around different content areas. And I think sometimes specifically even more so in mathematics because we, who is that saved for? And so I have always thought back to um, hidden figures, like with the movie, now now I can't remember like the name of the guy, but he played Sheldon on Big Bang, but (laughs) but he's speaking with Katherine Johnson about how her name can't go on the brief. Right, like so, she's done all the work, mm-hmm. but but it can't yeah, be even her. typed it right, done the work and and typed it up, and she's like saving all of them, and she can't get her name on the page, yeah. and you know I think like that's that guardrail, like it she was a computer, not a mathematician. All those guys were considered in that room were considered mathematicians, but she was never even understood anything that she was doing. I know (laughs) it was like, but she was considered a computer. Mm -hmm. And so like that we've, we've built those structures in place sometimes. And so, and we elevate, right. We elevate that, that thinking um, in different ways. And so just providing students with that, those opportunities to continually see themselves in that and see the struggle as part of being whatever that is, I think is is such a critical piece, A, of being human, but also being a mathematician and how we look at that. And let's be honest, I mean, kids cannot see themselves that way mm-hmm. if their teachers don't. Correct. Mm-hmm. They, they, I, I, it'll it'll be a very very strong five year old that can do that, you know, in 180 days with a, a teacher that does not believe in them. That's true. Um, we have a lot of power, and that's that's the individual teacher, yes, but it's also the culture of the school. You know, a lot of times it's like you know which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Which comes first, the competence or the identity? What does an A student look like? What does a mathematician look like? What does um, a child that tests for gifted look like? Mm -hmm. And if they don't look like you, okay, then we're going to make sure in our in our minds, maybe not intentionally, but we're going to make sure that you know the reality and the expectation kind of gel. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's a lot of work we need to do individually, yes, but also. You know, and this is where the advocacy comes in. Also, if there are systems in place in your school, you have to push back on them. Mm-hmm. If you know tracking is wrong, if you know that it's wrong that, you know, maybe certain families get certain privileges that other families don't, or certain families are in the know and they understand that they can request, you know, X, Y, Z tests, but other parents don't know. Mm-hmm. You know, is it really the competence mm-hmm. or is it the expectation of the individual or the culture of the school. Mm-hmm. So many big things right there. Yeah. Big, really big. Well, Marion, let's find out what you are working on now. Uh, okay. Um, teaching the kiddos. Uh, mm-hmm. great. Um, I do have um, an article coming out next month. Um probably the beginning of February, um, I co-authored with Dr. Kathry Ye uh, in Teaching Tolerance. So that's kind of exciting. And I've got some um, PD sessions. Um, I'm doing a a talk for the NCTM virtual. Um, Kathry and I are doing um, something for the NCTM annual meeting that will also be virtual. Um, So there's a couple of things. happening. Yay. Awesome. 
Okay. Yeah. And you, if you want to find it more out about Marion, and if you want to listen to her nice calming voice in more um, podcasts, she has quite a few of them on her website, which you can find right here. So Marian, we always thanks. learn so much yeah. from, from you there in those spaces. I was there was listening. a lot to listen to. I wanted I wanted to listen to more, but than it was now. So it's been an honor that people want to listen to the things that happen to come out of my mouth. Yeah. So um, <laughs> thank you so much for having me. It's been it's yeah. Been, thank you for the conversation that I didn't have to just pontificate by myself. I really appreciated that. Thank oh, you. Well, yeah. that's the part that we love the most. So yeah, we um, love hearing from different. When we talk all the time, so but we. <laughs> from different voices that we don't get to hear from all the time in a more intimate setting like this. I think sometimes when we hear people speak um, in conferences, it's fantastic, but just um, we so appreciate you coming on and being so approachable and um, open and, and sharing of your time and your expertise in this because we appreciate it so very much. And we know that um, people listening do as well. So thank you yes. very much. You're very welcome. Yes, thank you. And I'm going to say anyone that wants to chime in with answers to those questions, we can keep yes. that going in the discussion. Yes. So feel free. We'll, we'll pay attention to where that goes. But thank you so much. It really, truly was an honor and um, I'm going to be deep in thought now for a little bit. I so. I, I'm going to take the year yeah. to think about that question, and then we're going to have you back. <laughs> <laughs> Meet on the roller skating rink. Yes. 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 So yes. In the, in yeah. the next year, you're going to be in the roller skating rink, and we're going to be thinking about this question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oops. I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to kick her out so quick. Sorry, Marion, that was horrible. She can see us backstage. Well, thank that was that was so interesting and so oh. much, so much more to unpack there. So really yeah. fabulous conversation. Yeah. I know. Sure to sure to be having that conversation over and over. So you know, every time I listen to a podcast that Marion is on or something, I like ruminate for, for mm -hmm. days after and something will come back and I'll think about it in a different way, which I mean, which happens, you know, all the time. I'll think about something later. I'm like, Oh yeah. And we're we're very fortunate. We know that to have have such wonderful guests here with us. So yes. wonderful, wonderful. So we are gonna get ready to to head out. But um, if you would like to learn more about what we do at Looney Math, you can text Looney to two two eight two eight, and that will bring you um, get you on our our mailing list. Um, and Heidi, what do we have coming next week? Yes, so we are very excited. Um, next week will be February, which seems incredible already. <laughs> um, but we're very excited. We are gonna be having a conversation with Dr. Pamela E. Harris and Dr. Aries Winger. And um, they have a, um, a book that we're gonna be discussing and, um, and a, great, a great conversation around um, inclusion in the classroom and how we have, have conversations about mathematics with our students. Um, who are black and brown and and students in general. I think the the work there that is really applicable to so many, um, to all students, but specifically looking at it from that lens is, and we're really excited about that. So that's next yeah. Wednesday on the 3rd. Absolutely. Absolutely. Super, excited. Super excited. Well, thank you everybody for being here with us today and always be curious. See you Take everyone. care. Bye-bye.